All right, take three. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. This is the keep card assembly tutorial. Uh, this is the master tutorial. Uh, I was originally going to do uh, two separate tutorials, one for people who have done this a lot before, done a lot of soldering, uh, and one for people who had never SMT soldered before, but I'm just going to combine them into one tutorial. Um, if you have never soldered before or never SMT soldered, stick around. I'm going to have like safety guidelines, tips and tricks, recommendations for equipment and all that fun stuff. Um, if you have uh, SMT soldered before, uh, you can skip right to the assembly. Um, I'll, I'll put chapters down below somewhere. Um, if you've done this a lot and like you don't even think you need to look at assembly, um, I can get you going. There are a couple of gotchas on the board. Um, this is a prototype board. Uh, I'm soldering with leaded solder, which I will talk about. Um, it's fine, but I don't think I can sell it to anybody. So I'm using a prototype. Um, the only difference is that it's green. It was faster to get them that way. Um, the polarity on the battery is shown. So hook it up like that. Um, the programming header is rotated 180 degrees. So it is not, when you're looking at the board from the top, uh, it's not correct, basically. It's in the correct orientation like, like this. Um, that was for replacement, but I kind of regret it now. Um, it's also, it's a mini ISP. I don't know if it's actually called that, um, but it's it's not like the first six pins of a regular ISP. It is actually a different pinout. Um, so I would, I would go ahead and Google that. Uh, it should be on the Wikipedia page. Um, couple other things so it's marked but this is the first pin of the microcontroller so it is the the top rightmost pin um, in the normal orientation um, the parts you can tell the parts by uh, how many of them there are so they are they are not labeled and in fact the pull-up resistors there's two different types of pull-up resistors and they're exactly the same in here um, but the four pull-ups um, are I believe one R1 R2 R3 and R4 the two pull-ups right there um, are R5 and R6, which are on the back. And then the last little guy is uh, a ceramic capacitor that goes in C1 right there. Um, that's everything except, so when you get to the screen, it'll still work obviously, but uh, if you saw there's a screen in, you will notice that uh, there's a big gap. Um, so what I've been doing is taking off the, this plastic here. So I use some offset, um, or no, flush cutters. Um, and I don't actually cut anything, but I just kind of like wedge it in there. That'll give me a little leverage and I can pull them off. So however you want to do that, but uh, that's the way that I do it. Um, so yeah, so that, that should cover you. You could do it, you, if you've done this before, you, could, uh, you should probably be able to assemble it now. But uh, for everybody else, um, this is what you should get in the bag. It should look exactly like this. Um, I'm sorting these by hand, so uh, if you are missing any parts, you know, please tell me. Um, I can I can ship you something. Also, um, all of the, I guess not all of the SMT, but um, all these singular components, right? The resistors and the capacitors, um, like. If they are missing, uh, you actually you don't 100% need them. I would solder things up. Nothing is going to blow out. Um, you might use up the battery a little bit more or something. But you know, don't let that stop you from building it while you wait for me to send you like a single resistor or whatever. Um, but I'm gonna be doing a quality check, so hopefully that doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, you should get in your kit. You should get a screen, obviously. Up there again. I don't know why I put that back. Um, so we'll place this over here. Uh, there should be a parts bag, at least one parts bag, with obviously the real, um, the real PCB. I guess we'll put this aside. Um, parts bag should also have the battery in its battery holder, the AT Tiny itself pre-flashed, um, a little programming header pin set. We're gonna have to cut those later. Um, the four pull-ups, the two pull-ups, and the one uh, decoupling capacitor. So we'll talk about what all of those do. For now we are just going to place them aside. They're all in little separate things. So if you didn't buy switches, uh, that's what you should be getting. If you did buy switches, you'll get some switches. Um, 
Nobody will be getting these. These are like trash Jesus switches. I don't know. I made holy pandas out of uh, trash pandas. And uh, these are like the opposite, right? Like the um, trash panda stem and then the holy housing. So let's put those over here. Um, okay, I have some. Let me look. Do 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 do. Flaherty. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, all right. So let's go over uh, what's on the board for everybody, just so you know. Um, so we've been through a bunch of it, obviously. So here are the three switches. Um, these are the pull-up resistors for the switches. This will be where the screen goes. The screen is uh, an I2C or I2C squared C screen. Um, this is a programming header that helps us reprogram the board. So if you don't want to reprogram it, you don't have to solder that in. Um, this will be for the ATtiny85. This is the decoupling capacitor. So two more pull-ups. Um, and then this is the battery. Um, so, obviously, um, the switches are, are Cherry MX or Cherry-like switches. Uh, that means that they are normally open, uh, and then when you click them, they actually make a connection um, to from whatever pin to whatever pin. Um, in our case, we are making a connection to ground, and so that is actually, that's why we have these three things um, that are called pull-up resistors. And so what a pull-up resistor does is, um, if you place nothing on a pin, um, the voltage level of that pin is allowed to fluctuate. Uh, usually, and including in the case of an AT Tiny 85, um, with Arduinos, there will be a uh, there will be a pull-up resistor already built in. Um, however, those pull-up resistors are very small, um, like exceedingly small in the case of the AT Tiny. Um, so it could easily be overpowered in electrically noisy environments. Um, so that's why they're not like 100% required, um, but they will be, they'll be a little bit stronger. Um, they will pull a little bit more current from the battery, um, but like in infinitesimally small amount. Um, and that will allow the switches to remain high easier. And like obviously the problem that you're trying to avoid is if it's floating and it can be whatever, um, it might accidentally press something when you didn't even want it to press something. Um, so that is what a pull-up resistor is for. They are 22 kilo ohm resistors. Um, for the sake of simplicity, uh, we have a pull-up resistor of the same value right here. And so what that is doing is the, uh, the AT Tiny 85 has a reset pin. And that reset pin is actually used um, in a couple of different ways. Obviously, it resets, right? It like it's just like a restart on like a real computer. It like goes from square one. Um, the program starts all the way over again. Um, it's also used to program. It's used in the programming of the device. So that's something that we don't have to care about really. But basically, there is a dedicated uh, reset pin. Uh, theoretically, we could have disabled. Um, the reset logic, but then we would have needed like a much more sophisticated programmer um, Something that I like didn't even want to look into so we are we're using that as just 100% a bog standard reset pin um, And once again, you don't want that pin floating you don't want that pin to actually go low or accidentally go low and um, And like set off a reset when you don't want it to so we tie that to high as well with a pull-up resistor um, the only other component, the only other like single SMT component up here is the uh, decoupling capacitor. So what a decoupling capacitor does is if there are other uh, large and complex components on a board, um, you could propagate noise through the voltage lines. Um, so what a decoupling capacitor does is it'll sink that noise into ground. So basically, anytime that you have a like a complicated uh, integrated circuit component on a board, you're going to want a decoupling capacitor. Once again, um, you know, depending on the resiliency of the AT Tiny, that's that component isn't like necessarily required, but it's a good idea to have. It's um, it's like standard practice to always have decoupling capacitors, possibly even more than one, sometimes like three or four, um, around components in order to. Uh, smooth out like different levels of noise. Um, what else? So yeah, we have an AT Tiny. It's an AT Tiny 8510SU. Um, the 10 is very significant. The the S I think means that it's surface mount. I forget what the U means. Um, but uh, 
the 10 is actually relatively significant in that um, it is a less powerful chip than the AT Tiny normally is. The the 20, um, which also comes in an SU, um, I think it goes like one. It can be overclocked one level higher because we're using the standard like I think one megahertz uh, internal clock, um, and that is because the power draw of the device scales linearly with um, how fast the clock goes. So if you bought a, bump it up to eight megahertz or whatever, um, you are taking up eight times as much. You're gonna be using eight times as much power. Um, we are dwarfed by the screen. The screen takes up, I think it's like 22 milliamps um, when it's on like full blast. Uh, but we are not nearly dwarfed as much uh, when you are running it at the highest uh, overclocking. Um, so it's slightly less powerful. Uh, the reason we did that is because we don't need to support VUSB. Uh, you would need, or I've been told that you need an ATtiny 20SU to support uh, virtual USB, but we don't have a v, uh, we don't have a USB header on this board. Um, and then what it actually does is it goes down to a much lower voltage. I think it's like 2.7 volts. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Let me check real quick. Oh, no. Okay. Um, so, actually, the AT Tiny 20 SU goes down to 2.7. The AT Tiny 10 SU goes down to 1.8. So, we should be able to um, get the most out of, out of our battery. We shouldn't have to have any undervoltage problems. However, the, the screen is a little undervoltaged, so we'll see. Um, and so yeah, talking about the screen, um, this is an I squared C 128 by 32 uh, OLED screen. Um, OLED means that you turn the individual pixels on and off, so you actually save battery uh, when you have less pixels that are white. Um, so Pong is actually going to be probably uh, the, the best program for battery life, um, as opposed to Snake and Tetris. Um, but it's probably not a huge deal. We will also go over, um, if you want to upgrade your battery life, uh, getting a 1S LiPo uh, on there. Uh, yeah, I don't know what else to say about the screen. Uh, it's, it's run by an SSD 1306 driver. Um, that's like a standard or it's a relatively standard driver. Autofruit has written a couple of things about it. Um, there are, the data sheet is actually relatively easy to read for that. We will probably go into that in the programming tutorial. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do. Uh, if you look at the code, there's also gonna be some like weird stuff that's going on in there. And some of it is because of um, the programmer. You can eke out a lot more performance um, there's like there are a lot of pitfalls when you're programming in such a restricted environment. Um, like for instance, Pong originally uh, the memory addressing mode was horizontal, and I switched to vertical, and I got like an eight times speed bump. Um, so that was nice. Um, yeah, what else? We talked about the programming header a little bit. Um, basically, that is just that's just for programming the device again. Uh, we pull the reset pin like low and then I think we do something else and then it like literally steps through um, there's like a hardware component to this um, where it steps through the device and like rewrites the memory inside of it um, and then that changes uh, what the program does what the program is really um, the two pull-up resistors in the back we haven't really talked about um, they are uh, for the I squared C um, I believe I don't believe the AC Tiny has, uh, like it has pull-up resistors, but I don't think it has specific pull-up resistors for the I2C. Um, rails, basically. Uh, so what, what the pull-ups are supposed to do, um, the way that I2C works is that you actually have these two open lines um, and you use them for data transmission. And, you know, I don't know, that's like a subject for another video or something. Um, but basically, when somebody wants to talk, they are pulling these lines downwards and then they let them float upwards. Um, because if they drive them upwards, uh, you lose out on a lot of communication. There are like ways to do arbitration between multiple masters and other 
stuff. So they don't they don't want to pull them upwards because you might actually like silence another chip on the lines. Um, so what that means is that they have to drift upwards naturally. Um, so what the uh, pull-up resistors are doing are actually making those lines go back up again, like we've you know like we've been talking about, um, and they make them go up. They need like a specific value because they make them go up in a specific amount of time. Um, I don't know what speed we're communicating yet. We're probably communicating at the base speed for I squared C. There's not a lot of support for uh, higher speeds, but I'm not sure. Maybe. I didn't need to increase that for any of the programs, so I will I'll look into it if we get to a program that's a lot more complicated. Um, yeah, so I think that's everything on the board. I mean, the, the basic way that this all happens, you know, is that the microcontroller talks to the screen and it displays whatever the program is, and then it takes input from the, uh, the switches and that changes the program and the battery runs it all. And that's about it. All right, let's see, what else is there? Parts on the board. Yeah. All right, so, soldering. Um, so if you never soldered before, uh, let's go through some things real quick. Or if you never SMT soldered, whatever. Um, I have a Hako, I think, FX888D. Um, I definitely recommend it, but if you are looking to buy something, if you haven't actually uh, bought something yet, I definitely rec I recommend um, the Weller. I think it's like the first link on Amazon or something. I'll put it below. Um, I've heard good things about it. Uh, basically, if you... There are two types, or there's, you know, there's a way to partition um, soldering irons. Uh, there are digital ones and there are analog ones. Um, and the digital ones are a lot better because... Uh, for the same reason that like digital systems are better uh, like uh, fly-by-wire airplanes and stuff like that is that um, you don't when when you use an analog soldering iron it's actually like pushing power into the device and it doesn't really have a good control over what the temperature is um, for a digital system it's actually using like PID um, that will try and get to a specific temperature so you ha you can actually set the temperature instead of just like i don't know they they have wheels on the on the analog ones and they have numbers on them but it's kind of all it's all a little wishy-washy you know what i mean so i certainly recommend anything that hako makes um but they are pretty expensive uh, i shelled out and and it's been great I've, I've been having a great time with it um but you definitely don't need that um a weller would be great those are around 40 bucks um, but really, anything will probably be fine. Um, the, the stuff that we are soldering is not that sensitive, um, especially all of the through-hole stuff. Um, what else? I have an extractor, but it's terrible. So right now I'm just running um, just like a box fan. I'm right next to the window. So uh, I think that's okay. Um, definitely solder in a well-ventilated environment. Um, the... The fumes, no matter what you use, if you use uh, leaded or unleaded solder, um, the fumes are nasty uh, and they are not good for you. Uh, and you can actually, you can become allergic to them, I heard, uh, if you get exposed to them too much and then it's really hard to solder again. Um, and so to that end, I am using uh, leaded solder. I just got this stuff off of Amazon. Uh, all of the leaded solder is like the same, or I don't know, it's not the same, but like people have preferences, but they're not nearly as strong. Um, it's all pretty good. Uh, I think this is like Alpha Fry solder. It was the first thing that came up on Amazon. You can kind of a <laughs> kind of a theme there. Um, so this is 6040 uh, lead tin. Uh, it's got a rosin core. You want to make sure if you're buying leaded solder that you get that kind of stuff. Um, 6040 is a good ratio, and you definitely want rosin in there. Um, that's the bad stuff that comes out in the smoke, um, but it helps with wicking the metal to where it needs to go. Um, so just avoid the smoke and you'll be fine. Um, there are considerations, obviously, if you want to get unleaded solder, that's good. Uh, you should probably still wash your hands after using, after playing with the device and touching um, the solder points with unleaded solder. It's like, it's not, uh, you know, it's not food safe. It's not good for you. You, you shouldn't eat it. Um, you definitely don't want it on your hands. So, uh, 
I'm not going to tell you not to to buy unleaded solder um, because you certainly can. I actually bought some. Uh, I want to make a couple of the uh, kits and I want to sell those um, in order to fund like a little storefront or something. And I'm pretty sure that I can't sell kits that are soldered together with leaded solder. I'm going to check, but uh, I'm pretty sure. Um, so I'm not going to tell you not to get it, but it's probably not that much better for you. It's still toxic, um, and a lot of times they put in extra rosin uh, inside of it in order to get more wicking. Um, that's because it's harder to use, it doesn't wick as well. Um, there are something called like tin whiskers that can come out, uh, which are not great. Um, for our purposes, they're probably, it's probably not going to be a big deal, um, because, I don't know, there's not a, stuff really isn't that close together on our board. Um, and yeah, there's going to be more nasty stuff in the smoke. So, uh, it's your choice. Uh, I definitely recommend the leaded solder. Just basically, um, wash your hands. Uh, don't eat anything. I'm going to stop drinking this once we actually get into it. Don't eat anything while you're soldering. Wash your hands after you're done. Um, you know, solder in a place away from other stuff. Um, if you wipe down the surface, you can basically consider it clean afterwards. Um, yeah, it's not too bad. Also, like, if you, uh, what else? The actual problem with lead is, uh, lead oxides, um, not actual, like, elemental lead, like in, like in this. So if lead oxidates, uh, that's a lot worse for you because that's, uh, more easily taken up by your body. Um, so in order to actually get sick, if, like, if this is the only soldering thing you did and you literally, like, bit off a piece of this and ate it, uh, you'd probably still be 100% fine because uh, your body doesn't uptake it very much. Uh, even when it uptakes it uh, a little bit, there are things in your blood, I think, <laughs> uh, that actually carry away um, some of the stuff that your body did take up um, and you know your, your body disposes of it. So the real problem is repeated exposure. So that's why, I don't know, that's why you hear about like paint chips, lead paint chips, um, because they've been sticking around for years, they've oxidized, and usually, you know, like kids will eat them because lead actually tastes a little bit sweet. Um, and then they'll get like exposure over a very long period of time. And that's what messes you up. So basically what I'm trying to say is, um, take whatever pre precautions you want to, you will probably be fine if you use leaded solder. Um, what else? Uh, avoid the smoke. Yeah, okay. Um, so if you haven't ever soldered before at all, um, I would actually not recommend starting here. Um, if you've never SMT soldered before, I think this is a great place to start. Um, also, you'll probably, you know, if you've never soldered before, you'll probably be okay. Um, You'll probably be fine, but what I would recommend actually is just getting um, a soldering kit off of Amazon or or wherever you want to go. I don't know if you have like a Fry's Electronics near you or something, um, and just get like a through hole soldering kit. Um, I will I'll link the ones that I like below. I like the the radio ones because then at the end of it you have a radio and like sure nobody listens to the radio anymore, but it's still pretty cool, you know. Instead of just like oh this thing lights up or whatever and it's like an array of LEDs or something, um, they do they have a lot more parts and they're a little bit more expensive, not too much, but uh, I think it's worth it. Um, and so just really like. All you need to do is just solder a little bit beforehand, and you'll you'll be like, oh, okay, like I understand this stuff now. Um, but like, I don't know. <laughs> if you don't want to do that, you know, give it a shot. I'll I'll try my best to uh, to guide people through the process. Um, all right, I think we should we should start going. Uh, I have my soldering iron set to 800 degrees. Um, 750-800 is fine. Anywhere around there is fine. If you're using unleaded solder, um, I would use whatever recommended temperature comes up on your um, solder, because I think it's different depending on the uh, composition. All right, so uh, we went over what parts we have already. Um, what I like to do uh, to start these boards is I actually tin um, half of the SMT pads and then I go and I usually I try to tin the most difficult pad because it's a lot easier to uh, tin it now than tin it later. Um, so 
uh, with that in mind, we're going to start with R4, we'll do C1, we'll do the AT Tiny, we'll do these three. And what I mean by tin half is like just, you know, there are two pads on most of them. Obviously, the AT Tiny has a bajillion. Um, I just tin one of them. Um, and then I'll show you my technique later. Um, so with the soldering iron, um, you're going to want you're going to want to tin the soldering iron as well. Soldering, there you go. Soldering tip or whatever. Um, so that's just putting a little bit of solder on the tip. Uh, that's going to use the the rosin to clean the tip, um, and it will keep it lasting a little bit better. It'll make things flow a little bit. Sorry, getting some water. There we go. Get some water into my sponge. Clean it off with the sponge, and there you go. That looks pretty good. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. If you've never soldered before, I mean, it's pretty simple. You are applying heat. Uh, you want to create a joint. We're not creating joints right now. We're just uh, pre-tinning the pads. Um, so all we are going to do is we are going to uh, touch the soldering iron to the pad and then melt a little bit of solder on the pad. Just enough. But that's actually a little bit too much. Sometimes I try and like flick off a little bit. Yeah, there you go. Cool. Um, yeah, so that one's good. Uh, here, we'll do this one now. And see, it's pretty easy. Boom. It's a little too much. You don't really have to worry about how much it is. I just, I like it to look pretty. I want this to come out pretty. So, um, alright, so let's do the inner pads here. So I'm just touching it, and then I feed it in. And, um, one thing you want to do is, especially when you're tinning these pads, is you want to, um, you actually want the solder to hit the soldering iron, especially right now, um, because if you just put like a dry soldering iron down onto the pad um, and then put the solder, it's gonna be really hard, um, put the solder and like not touch the iron, um, you're gonna have to wait for the soldering iron to heat up the pad um, and then the solder will flow. Uh, normally what people tell you to do, especially with like through hole, is that you don't actually want to touch the um, tip of the soldering iron because solder will flow where the heat is. So you actually want it to be as far away from the heat as possible. And that's true. Um, however, with these tiny little pads, uh, they heat up almost immediately. Um, the heat will saturate the whole pad uh, and it's gonna be really hard to not touch it. So uh, we'll, we'll get to that. And so let's see, what else? Uh, the last pad here. So. I'm gonna do the first pad of the AT Tiny and just a tiny bit there. And that looks good. Okay, so that's all that. Um, so I'm going to show you uh, my technique for getting these on. Uh, so I definitely recommend um, if we were going to do like um, tools or whatever, de definitely recommend some tweezers. Um, I really like these, whatever these bent tweezers are, basically. Um, the straight ones are a little bit more difficult to use for this application. Um, and then the offset cutters that you saw previously. And that's strictly just for the screen. Uh, and really, that's about it. Alright, so let's start with the decoupling capacitor. Um, I like to just use the, the tweezers to get this stuff off. Just like a little bit, ooh, a little bit of paper there. Hey, come on. There we go. Okay. So, um, none of these tiny little, they're called 0805 components. Um, none of these are directional, right? So there's no, there are no pads. There's no diodes. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, so you can put them any which way. So... I'm gonna take this little guy. And so I do like a three-step process for putting these things on. Uh, what I do is I heat up the solder and I just get it into the solder at all. I like, like just get it anywhere, even if it's like super, you know, tilted or whatever. Um, and then I let that cool. Uh, and then I grab it and I push it down and then I heat up the solder and that'll just situate it on the pad. And it doesn't have to be exact. Um, and then, finally, the last thing you do is you grab it again, uh, you heat it up, and then you put it into its final place. So, if we snag this little guy, we heat up the pad, and we just get it there at all. 
And so that one's a little bit tilted. So then I push down. Boop, like that. And now let's see. Eh. That can be a little bit straighter. There you go. Perfect. So if you wanted to uh, solder the other pad now, you certainly could. But uh, I usually just go assembly line style. So I'm going to get... Oh, no, actually, we are not doing those yet. Um, we're not going to do the uh, pull-up resistors for the I2C rails until we get to the, the other side. I'm just doing the top side for now. Okay. Blue. So nothing is directional, but there are tops and bottoms. So you're going to want the black label, or the black side with the white label uh, to be facing upwards. Alright, so I always like to um, have my iron in my right hand. Um, so I use my left hand place the components, which means that I want the pad that I pretend to be on the right. So same deal, just heat it up, stick it in there, get it in there at all, push it down, heat it up. That one's pretty good. I'm done with that one. Same deal. You notice that I'm really, it doesn't take very much. It goes very fast. This one could be a little straighter. Oh uh, yeah, these are all 0805, um, that is like, ooh, it's like a designation of size. Um, I think the, the smaller they go, the smaller the part is. Uh, 0805 is one of the bigger um, SMT sizes. So, oop, I flicked that one. So basically what I'm saying is, uh, this is pretty good. This is, you know, they're pretty easy to do. Uh, you get a lot of leeway. Alright, so the last one. There's also hand soldering um, footprints. So there's a little extra room on the side. Push it down. Ooh, there you go. And... Oh. Oh gosh, I mean it's so much worse. Okay, that's fine. Alright, so now that we have the whole top of the board, we will uh, solder these up. And so now, um, now you do kind of want to, you don't want to just feed things directly into the soldering tip. Um, so I'm going to tin it again, and the reason I'm going to tin it again is because uh, what I was saying with a dry tip still... Um, still counts is that uh, a dry tip is not great. You actually want at least a little bit of solder on the tip. And so sometimes what I will do is if things are not heating up fast, things are gonna heat up fast just fine for these components, but it might happen on the through hole components. If things are not heating up enough, I will actually feed directly into like the tip. Um, and then what that's going to do is that's going to go to the tip, it's going to hit the other components, and then it's going to like rapidly increase how fast everything heats up. So people tell you not to feed into the tip, but they just mean don't feed, you know, the whole thing into the tip. You always want at least a little bit of solder on the tip. Um, and so yeah, you just, you're going to put the tip in here, you're going to hit the pad, you're going to hit the component on the side here, and then just feed into like kind of all three of them. And then go up. It should be almost automatic. At 750, 800 degrees, it should be almost completely immediate. That one took like a tiny second. Oh, that's so much. There. Okay, that's fine. Cool. Alright, so two more. See, this is going to be fast. Get out of here in no time. That looks good. Okay. So, the, by far, um, the hardest uh, part of this build is getting the AT Tiny on there. So, I'm going to get one more thing. Aha. Um, so, I definitely recommend one of these. This is just some, like, super cheap, um, but this is a, a rosin pen. Um, so, it's got, like, a little nib. Um, and you kind of press it, and it comes out. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, you can. Um, and so that is just like pure, I don't know, rosin. I don't know if it's like adulterated with anything. It might be like alcohol or something. 
Um, and that is actually going to help us get a solder to where it's going to go. Uh, solder goes to where it's not supposed to go. I recommend getting a solder sucker. These are the only things that have worked for me. Um, if you, I don't know, if you can get soldering wick to work, like be my guest, I've never gotten it to work. This is the Engineer SS02 solder sucker. Um, and this is my favorite one. It's got this, this tip here that you can see. Uh, and that is like, just like a little silicone tube. Um, it comes with just one tip and you can buy the, the like, like tip material from them, but it's like 20 bucks. Uh, it's just like silicon tubing, silicone tubing. So I don't know, I bought some random stuff and it's been fine. Um, but the nice thing about the tip is that it gives you a lot more control over like how big of an area you want to suck. So we shouldn't have to do it. Um, but if you do need one, I definitely recommend one of these. You can get some cheap ones from China um, that like are just plastic tips. Those are actually okay. Like if you're not going to get, in my opinion, uh, in my opinion is different than a lot of people's opinions. If you're not going to get one that has um, like the silicone, the soft silicone tip, you might as well get the cheapest one that you can find. Um, I've played around with other ones that are supposed to be better that were like, I don't know, 12 bucks or whatever. Um, not like three bucks it took, you know, two months to get here. Um, and they just, they didn't work as good <laughs> as the Chinese ones. Uh, so yeah, but we probably won't need to use that. Anyways, um, we are going to use just a little bit of extra rosin on these. And so what that's going to do is that's going to like smoke up, um, but it is going to wick the solder a little bit more. Uh, and that's going to help us not create bridges. So the first thing we're going to do, it's the exact same procedure. I'm going to tin this tip again. Just because there's not a ton on there. Yeah. It's the exact same procedure. Uh, make sure that the dot, can you see that? Yeah, the dot right there. If you're holding it like this, the dot is in the bottom right. Um, and then just come over here. These pads are huge. Tamp it down. That looks, yeah, that looks, come on. Let's go like a tiny bit higher. Okay, that looks pretty good. Yeah, so the pads are huge on this, um, and they're a little bit spaced out. So just be careful. And so then how I do these is, now that I've got that one, um, I guess we'll, We'll tack it down on the other side as well. So this is going to be really hard to feed, but once again, these pads are so small that um, if you have to feed it into kind of like the iron and not the actual joint, it'll probably flow into the joint. And that looks pretty good. Um, all right, so now that it's tacked down, we want to go just kind of like in order here and kind of just feed it in and let it flow. Oh, wow, I hit a bunch of them, actually. Yeah, so another way you can do this, yeah, we look good, okay. Another way you can do this is yeah, you can actually just bridge all of the pins, put a bunch of like rosin on there, um, and then just hit all of them at once, and then the rosin is going to wick, and it's going to um, bring the solder to the pins. Um, I, I like trying to do the individual pins because worst case scenario, you accidentally do multiple pins anyways. Um, and the individual pins, you're like guaranteed not to fail, or like they're guaranteed to work, but if you fail at doing it, uh, then doing multiple pins might also work as well. Same deal here. Oh wow, that's huge. Now we're good. Let me be, let me try and look a little. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, that's okay. Cool. Like I said, this is the hardest part. Perfect, there you go. Um, if you have a multimeter, this is a good time to test it, but I can see, and we can even, I can actually increase. Man, phones are so cool these days. Uh, you can see that there are no bridges, so we are all set. Um, and so that's it, that's all the SMT on the top. So we're gonna go to the back. Uh, we are going to do the two 
uh, resistors, and then we're going to go back to the front, sort of. Uh, we are going to put the uh, switches in and do those. Uh, and maybe the, uh, actually maybe the screen first. Yeah, we'll do the screen first. Okay, well, in any case, we have to do the resistors. And so I forget, I think, yeah. It's okay. Yeah, so the story with these is that, uh, um, Probably not necessary. Uh, they are on the spec for I squared C, uh, and they are probably not quite exactly the correct value because the spec specifies 4.7 kilovolts um, or kilo kilo ohms, but there are internal pull-ups in the AT Tiny. Uh, however, uh, it's probably going to be just fine. Like, it, it's definitely within an acceptable margin of error. Um, and a lot of people don't even put these on. Like, uh, when I was building my Ergodox, uh, there were resistors that were uh, optional. And and I was like, oh, that's weird. Uh, and eventually I realized that those were, like, the I squared C resistors. So, uh, it will work just fine if you don't put these on. But you might as well. These ones are going to be a little bit harder because... There's stuff on the other side now. All that stuff that we soldered. But it's better than doing it the other way. So yeah, just get these situated. Uh, you can use some helping hands if you're having a hard time. And then spin it around. Put some solder in the joint. Oh no, there you go. Oh, come on. Okay. All right. So yeah, let's do the screen because the screen is the next flattest thing. So here you go. This is the screen. Yours should look pretty similar. Uh, I'd leave the protective material on for now. So let's try and get, there are a couple components on the side here, but you can get much closer uh, if you get this plastic off. So we'll try and do this really close. But I really just kind of like, I squeeze, I don't squeeze all the way. And then that gives you a little bit of leverage here. And then sometimes you can just finagle it the rest of the way. Oh gosh, or sometimes you can't. Come on. Ooh. Oh, okay. This one is not cooperative. There we go. All right, usually they're easier than this, but uh, usually they'll just start to slide. Okay, cool. So now we got these pins. Uh, the orientation is self-evident. <laughs> um, the way that I like to do these, so these are through holes now. Um, similar though, I like to tack one thing down and it like really doesn't matter. Um, you just get it there. And so this is when you can start thinking about um, having some tin on the soldering iron uh, and then soldering on the opposite side. So we will do that next time. Um, but once you get that on there, obviously this is like not how you want it. Just heat it up while you hold it and try and get it into the correct position. Not quite. It's a little bit of try and, trial and error. Uh, I probably did that off screen, huh? That looks pretty good to me. Maybe, maybe just a tiny bit though. Oh yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. I think that's pretty good. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's about as good as we're going to get. So. Just like that. So then what you can do is uh, go through the rest of the pins. So what I was talking about, a little bit of solder on there, and then you can go on the opposite side. And, uh, don't be afraid to, you know, if it feels like there's not enough solder, just add a little bit of extra. Just, you know, go back to the other side once you're done. And then usually come back to that first pin once you're all set. So, this pin is a little high, but that's okay. All right, and there you go. It's, uh, it's all slaughtered up. Um, so now what you can do is you can use these offset cutters. And you can snip these. Um, forgot to say, uh, wear eye protection. Um, I'll put that down below or something. Uh, wear eye protection uh, partially because you don't want the soldering fumes to get in your eyes. You don't want any uh, splatter from the solder to get in your eyes either. Um, the rosin can bubble a little bit and throw a tiny little flex. Um, and then also, you are going to be cutting these, and they go crazy. So, if you wanted to do that over a bin or something, that might be uh, better. Um, yeah, don't worry about this pin. This is a ground pin, so they're supposed to be connected. It's, it's They're super close together, and that's fine. You could bridge them if you wanted to. Nice, so that's flat. Oh, goddamn. That's a little crooked. <laughs> Take your time on these. Uh, you can definitely get these crooked. Let's see, can we heat it? Ooh, can we heat it up? Okay, um, so the next stuff that we are going to do, I guess we could do, we could do the programming header. No, I'm just trying to leave the battery for last. Let's do the programming header. So, um, snap these however you like. If you have the offset, or the, uh, whatever it's called, the flat cutters, flush cutters, uh, they make it pretty easy. There. Uh, it was, I could not find like a two by three headers uh, that wouldn't cost like an arm and a leg like it was it was ridiculous um, so same thing as everything else is a through hole so they're pretty forgiving a little tin on there go from the other side and then uh, while you're holding this this one actually came out pretty well uh, while you're holding this make sure that you don't hold the pin that you have just tinned so you hold it, you heat it up, and you wiggle it until it's exactly flush the way you want it. And then probably what will help is doing the next set and tacking that down uh, just so that they can uh, play, they can uh, use each other for support. So let's see, let's try and get this there. So once again, come on. there we go. If you're worried about it, you can um, tack it down on the opposite side. That one is definitely way off. There. And there you go. That's a nice little header. Okay. Now just get the rest of the pins. This one's definitely go. Uh, come on. There you go. There you go. Is that one good? Yeah. Yeah, I like to use a little bit extra. Cool. It's not really a good reason to cut these ones because they are already so small. Um, so yeah, that's the programming header. Let's move on to the switches, I guess. Sure. Ooh. Um, so the switches, uh, 
a lot of the switches that are going to be, if you got switches, um, a lot of switches that are going to be coming are not going to have the PCB stabilizers. Uh, there's just not that many switches that have them. It was going to be, I wanted to buy a bunch of switches, uh, and it was going to be a lot more fun if uh, we got switches that didn't have those stabilizers. They're really, uh, I don't know, on a board like this, they're really not required. Um, so I decided to go with it. Um, in that case, nothing is really going to grab onto the switch. So you are going to have to just kind of lay it down in there. And then just like everything else, uh, you use helping hands for this if you want. But I'm oh, okay with just kind of doing it freehand. Get it in there. This one's pretty good, but you can just hold the switch down and make absolutely sure. We'll go ahead and do assembly style. So. Go for the next switch. Put it right in there. Just get it in there. These are going to take a lot more solder. And they are, uh, it's a lot bigger of a pad, so it takes a little bit to heat up, but that's okay. Make sure it's absolutely perfect. Yeah, okay. We're going to have to, uh, we might put the um, keycaps on these first before we finish everything. On there. Okay. So, you will notice that it's pretty easy to rotate these because there's no plate. So, we will chuck the keycaps on there real quick. Wow, these are tight. Cool. So obviously that doesn't look that good. So same as always. And we grab the component and you're just gonna have to eyeball it. You might be able to go kinda like this. There, much better. side. Much better. Last one. Oh, did the wrong pin. Oh, too far. <laughs> All right, let's see here. Boom. Oh, that middle one is just like the tiniest bit. Is it the outside? That's oh, the middle one. Okay. There we go. Look at that. That's beautiful. So nice and straight uh, nice and parallel all right we're getting really close here um so yeah let's just uh we'll finish up the switches real quick <sighs> yeah let's get there i have the phone is literally on top of my helping hands so i'm just gonna grab some helping hands here and that's gonna help us because that's what they're supposed to do. All right, so the last little bit. Solder, get it in there. Uh, you know, of any component, the switches can take a lot of thermal load, so. Which is saying something, because there's not a ton of uh, metal in there. Um, so yeah, don't worry about uh, being too dainty with it. Alright, so the final component is the battery here. So they're packaged in this little plastic so that it... Oops, sorry. <laughs> so the final component is the battery here, and they're packaged in this little 
bit of uh, like packing tape so that they don't touch anything else. Um, should be relatively easy to get off. It's just packing tape. scissors or flush cutters. Um, sometimes you can, there's like a pretty visible edge and you can just grab that. Boom, and there you go. Cool, so, um, oh, this is installed wrong too, okay. <laughs> oh, no, it's not. No, it is, right? Oh my gosh. So that is, yeah, there you go, okay, cool. All right, so um, it displays, oh my gosh. So if you can see here, uh, that is the plus sign, right? And so you're like, oh yeah, plus sign, it's on the right. It is on the right, um, it is not down. So the plus side of the battery is the large part of the battery. And you'll notice that the, the negative side then is this inner circle here, and it's got this, like a tiny little gasket there. Um, so this is the negative side. The negative side goes down because the negative side contacts these little these little tines here. Um, and so the right is the positive, um, but that's because it's contacting the sides of the uh, the battery holder. So we're not going to solder it with it snapped in, but this is the correct orientation with the plus up and facing you. Um, so what we're going to do, what I like to do with these, um, is first off you got to get it kind of flat i like to tin one pad a bunch i like to have a ton of shit on this pad uh you know maybe less than that usually and then i tin one pad a tiny bit and so i take the negative and let me just where is i want to prepare it earlier Okay. Yeah, because it's upside down. Here's the one I prepared earlier. So. Take the negative, and then I'm not even going to uh, use the tweezers because it's so huge. And then you just you heat up the solder Ooh. beneath the pad. and it will flow to the surface. Hopefully it doesn't splatter like that. It's the first time that's ever happened to me. Cool. And so you can uh, just make sure that you get it situated pretty well. Um, and then there is a tiny bit, I mean pretty well, but also like it bends and folds and stuff, so. And then there is a tiny bit of solder over here now that you put down. And so you can actually, and I would tin the tip a little bit just so that you have some thermal mass here. You can press this down, and then that solder will flow up as well. And then you can finish that. I ended up putting a lot, so that's fine. There you go. Okay, cool. So, uh, we soldered everything up. Moment of truth. <laughs> Hopefully it works. I used to get to, you get to take off the uh, protective. Uh, plastic here. Oh, all right. Let's just go from the opposite side. Boom. Beautiful. Okay. Does it run? Yeah, it runs. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. So there you go. Um, that is the assembly tutorial. As I turn it off, just pull it out. Uh, that's it. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for, for coming along. Uh, let me know in the comments if anything was confusing or if, uh, I don't know, if you know how to do something better or if you need further clarification or anything. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be making a couple more of these. The first one that I made so far, but uh, I want to make a, uh, a flashing tutorial because that's not non-trivial. Um, and I'm also going to make a programming tutorial, hopefully. So uh, stick around, those will be posted up here, they'll be on the Instagram as well. Uh, you know, I don't know, like, subscribe, whatever, I, I, don't, I don't think I really care about that yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks a lot, have a good one. One hour, one hour exactly. Uh, it probably, it won't take you that long if you do too, I promise. <laughs>